So last week, we talked about where our help comes from, right? Our help comes from the Lord. It comes from God. It doesn't come from other places, other things. We're in this series. Is this real life going on? These different subjects. Just thinking about, um, you know, how sometimes we get things mixed up, you know, and, and where we start going on this path where we think that, our help comes from somewhere else instead of from God, you know? Um, or we start acting a certain way, and that's just kind of how everybody is. But is that the way that we're supposed to live? All these different things we're talking about. Today, you know, I just want to talk about some things that might be relevant to where we are today. Um, you can let me know. But uh, I want to talk about being offended. <clears throat> Or causing a, an offense, because we do that too. Um, and you know, sometimes, you know, when I say sometimes, you know, maybe it's a lot. Maybe it's all the time. You know, people sin against us. Sometimes we sin against other people. But there's things that happen, you know, like conversations that are had, words that are spoken that um, are hurtful are mean or untrue, all these different things. And, you know, of course, like I said, maybe this relates to where we're at. Um, I know that when I look at Facebook, I see a lot of stuff. But we won't talk about that right now. Um, but, you know, sometimes things happen to us, and, and, you know, there's different things that we can do, different ways that we can react. Sometimes we just try to avoid it. We try to, you know, minimize it or just say, you know what, I'm just going to ignore this thing and, like it didn't happen. Sometimes we get offended. We do the opposite thing, and we're like, this person is wrong. They are so wrong, and I am actually going to tell them how wrong they are. I'm going to let them know, and I'm not just going to let them know calmly. I'm going to really let them know how I feel. They offended me, and I'm going to come at them with the full force of my in indignation. My offense, and I'm going to come at them. You know, there's so many, we can pretend it didn't happen, we can ignore it, we can come at them, and all these things, but I want to look at what the Bible says about offenses. And that's not to plot to get even, just in case you're wondering. Was anybody wondering? Because I feel like, really in this series, is this real life? That's kind of like the, well, that is real life, right? You plot to get even. You have to match their offense with your offense. Because it really turns out to be you causing the offense then also. But all of a sudden we're stuck in this cycle. We don't see that. Like when something happens and we get just this, we say, well, this is righteous anger right here. This is the way that it's supposed to be. And, and, and I will say, really? Really? Because how much can you say that that, that is separated from just what is going on in your feelings inside because righteous anger doesn't have anything to do with our feelings. It doesn't have anything to do with the way that we feel. It has to do with how God feels. And most of the time, if not almost all the time, whenever we come at something, it has to do with how we feel and not what God is saying. This word offended, it's scandalon. Scandalon. 
It means to put a snare or stumbling, stumbling block in the way. And it's so interesting. It's like scandalous. It's where scandalous came from. It's like, oh, it's scandalous. This stumbling block to put a snare, to put a stick like in the ground for somebody to trip over. And what's interesting is this word is used about the cross, about the cross of Christ. And I want to tell you that, that this word should be used about the cross of Christ, but it shouldn't be used in our reactions to other people, or it shouldn't be used to somehow produce some defensive mechanism or some anger toward what is happening around us. See, this is what happened, and it says in the Bible that the offense of the cross, and what it was is that in that day, in this day, in our day, what the offense of the cross is, is that it's put in front of us to be a stumbling block, not like in the bad way, because it seems like, man, that seems like a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, there's bad stumbling blocks. But the cross being put in front of us for our sin to trip over, for our unrighteousness to trip over, because our sin and our unrighteousness can't get past that cross and make it through on the other side and still be standing up. Right? So the offense of the cross. But so many times we hear even in, I won't say hear, but in the church in general, in the body of Christ, with brothers and sisters, there are so many times offenses that come and, and what the people call offenses. People say, well, this happened. What happened? Well, you know, my friend didn't call me back. And they were supposed to call me back. And you're offended. Well, you know... It's like so many different things, or even in church, and, and I, I maybe want to tread carefully, but in church, and it's like, well, I left that church because <laughs> because the music was too loud. Shoo. See, I'm, I'm really trying to tread carefully. I, you wouldn't believe the people at that church. What's wrong with them? Well, they have the air conditioning too cold. Uh. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what happened. And we have these offenses that come. We have these things that, that we build up this offense, this grudge, this thing inside of us, like you can't believe what happened to me. And in Matthew 18, starting in verse 1, we have something that Jesus addresses here, and it starts out where it says, at the time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So Jesus starts speaking. They're like, who's the greatest? Come on, tell us. Tell us, we want to know who's the top. That's right, Jesus is the top. Who's the greatest? We want, you, you know, we're going to fight amongst ourselves and, and see who's stronger. We're going to see who prays better. We're going to see who, whatever, all these different things. Who's the greatest? He's like, listen, you don't understand. Unless you come and are converted or saved and, and come humbly as this little child. What does he mean by that? 
Have you ever seen little children? And, and look, I will say this definitely, this definitely fits in today's scenario. Because little children don't come with preconceived ideas or thoughts or anger. Right? My, my son, my youngest son, like his, one of his best friends in school, and now they got like different classes. Well, now we're at home, but before that, you know, switch classes and stuff. One of his best friends was this young little dude, and what was his name? What? Say it again. Kendall. Gosh. Why are you whispering? Oh, my gosh. Kendall. The cutest little black kid in his class. And they would run around together, and he would have braids all the time. His mom would do his braids, and, and they were like the best of friends. And he'd come hang out at the house, and, and it was just like the, the coolest thing. And I think about little kids and how they don't have some idea of the way that things are, well, this is how it's supposed to be. This is, this is how it is, or this person did that, or this is how I should think this way. They don't. They don't know how to think. They just think. They just live life. They just love people. They get in fights and then run around and share popsicles later. It's just like... The humility of a little child. There's no reason that I should have an offense. Yeah, we just got in a little spat, you know? We just, like, fought a little bit. But I like this guy. I mean, I just, why not? He's just my friend. He's just, what? That was, like, five minutes ago. Now we're playing, See? But for some reason, as we get older, we like to hang on to things, right? Well, this happened like 10 years ago. Well, this happened like 20 years ago. And so, listen, this is, you know, don't even get me started about that. Why? There should be nothing to be started. I'm sorry. I'm going to get back to my scripture here. Verse 5, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That is intense. That is intense. What's he saying? He's like, Jesus is like, listen. To cause somebody to sin, to, to be a stumbling block for somebody. And what it is, like, seriously, talking about offense, what this is, whenever I do something, we're going to talk about whenever somebody does something to me, whenever I do something to somebody, all these things. But when we do something to somebody to cause them to sin, to cause them to be offended, to cause them to act in a way that they know God doesn't want them to act. What does Jesus say about that? It'd be better for me to have a millstone tied to my neck. You know what a millstone is? They're like gigantic rocks. And this gigantic stone mill that are rolled around on the base Right now we get mortar, mortar and pestle, right? Anybody know what those are? They're like this big with a little stone, a stone bowl, stone, you know. And you're like, oh, I'm going to grind up this, you know, whatever it is that I'm grinding up. That's not what Jesus, he's not like hang one of those little things on your neck and jump in the sea. He's like, no, this, this millstone is probably like a thousand pounds. That it takes cattle to... Be tied to it to turn it around. 
How about tying one? It's, it's better actually if you tie one of those to your neck, if a person ties one of those to their neck and is drowned in the ocean, than if you cause somebody else to sin. Right? That's intense. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. He's saying offenses, it, they're going to come. Things are, he's just saying things are going to happen. But woe to the man that causes them to happen. Better watch out if you're the one causing the offense, the sin, to happen. Because you're in trouble then. Don't be that man or that woman. Woe to the man by whom the offense comes. So Jesus is saying, unless you are humbled, as one of these little children, then we won't enter the kingdom of God. And then he's saying, and if you're not humbled, and if you cause somebody offense, if you're being this person that causes these fights and this anger, these offenses, that you're in some serious trouble. I'll just leave it at that. Don't cause offenses. Don't be offended. How much should we take from people? How much should I let this go? How much should I keep allowing this to happen? See, it's not, you know, the Bible doesn't say that we're to be, you know, doormats and walked on. You don't keep putting yourself in a position to get in that place. But don't also be causing offenses. Forgiving doesn't mean that what the person did is okay. Forgiveness means that you can for, let, forgive and allow God to work in that situation and you not to work in that situation. How many times do we want to just work in that situation? But God says, let me do the work. So what if we do feel offended? What happens? Or what if something happens to us? So I'm not going to read the whole scripture, but Jesus goes on to, to talk about how you deal with things. And what does he say? He says, just a little bit later in this same chapter, and he says, go to the person and tell them what has happened. Say, you have offended me. One on one. Hey, this thing that you said or this thing that you did. It didn't feel good. I don't feel that it was, was right. And deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. If that doesn't work, Jesus says, if they don't understand, if they don't say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So many times we still can't let go, even if somebody does say, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that happened. Like, well, you should have, and I'm going to hold this against you. But Jesus says, if that doesn't work, then two or more of you gather some people around you because where two or more are gathered, I'm in their midst, and, and, and you'll have uh, counselors around you. you have people that can, can see what is going on in the situation. Not a gang of people. Not to bully somebody, not to come at them and, and, and overpower them, but just to have another person or maybe two people there with you so they can see and understand. Because really, maybe you've gotten some things wrong also. 
Maybe you took it in the wrong way. It'll be helpful to have another person there to see the situation and to be helpful in that conversation. If that doesn't work, he says, tell the church. Let a greater number of people in the body know. Because it becomes the, an issue then if there's no change of heart, if there's nothing that's happened. And, and if that doesn't work, what does he say? He says, if that doesn't work, if you've gone alone just to say what has happened and, and, and how you felt like you were mistreated or whatever and that doesn't work and then you go with somebody else and to be with you and to help you in that situation, that doesn't work. And then if you talk to the church and, and, and have a greater number of people there to help with that situation, and if that doesn't work, then you should just treat them as if they were a tax collector or a heathen. What does that mean? See, because I think sometimes we can read these scriptures and say, oh, man, See, I get to come to them by myself, and then I'm going to bring a buddy with me, and I'm going to come at them, and then I'm going to bring the church at them, and then we're all going to get them. And if that doesn't happen, then we get to treat them like the sinners. We get to treat them like the tax, you know, those cheats. Just kick them out and never talk to them again. No. What does the Bible say about how to treat those that are in sin? What does the Bible say? But how she, you should, in, the, in that day, the tax collector, they cheated everybody, okay? I'm not talking about tax collector today. I'm sorry if you work, you know, sorry. But in that day, they were all cheats, okay? <laughs> but what does the Bible say about how we treat them? We love them. Love them. They're like, wait a second. I thought this was going more and more in my favor. No, it's going more and more in God's favor and their favor. Then treat them. Then think of them as a heathen or a tax collector. What does that mean? It means to love them, but maybe you don't hang out with them as much. Right? Think about this with me for a second. Hey, I love you, but I can't go to the party with you. I can't hang out where you are doing your stuff. I can't hang out with you where you are getting with the people and causing a ruckus and yelling at people and talking bad about people and doing all this stuff. I'm just not going to be able to do it. I love you, though. I love you. Hey, the tax collector. What are they? Hey, I can't come and get into your arena and start cheating people and acting like you. I'm actually going to have to step back, but I love you. See, that's in this scripture. I don't know about you, about you, but whenever I like read through this and I'm like, man, it's like a full circle thing because you go from this love and you go through this situation and it goes back to love. Maybe you were hanging out with them a lot here and you're not here. But in both places, there's love. In Proverbs 25, verse 8, it says, Do not go hastily to court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? I love this verse. Because what will you do when your neighbor has put you to shame? Debate your case with your neighbor and do not disclose the secret to another. Saying, look, just argue about the situation calmly. Talk about it. Work through it. Don't hastily take them to court and start yelling at them on social media and doing all this stuff and getting in a fight. And, and so that everybody, see, I want everybody else to see how bad they are. Well, they're seeing how bad you are now, too. Right? I feel like this is what this is saying. Be careful 
how quickly you take somebody to court. Be careful arguing with somebody on Facebook because you're not making them look stupid. You're making yourself look stupid. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Work these things out is what we're hearing here. Talk, understand, listen, forgive. Going back to Matthew 18, down in verse 21, then Peter came to him. I love this because Jesus is talking about, look, they're asking, like, who is the greatest? And he's like, come as a little child, be humble in humility. And also, don't cause others to stumble. Don't cause an offense. Don't do all this stuff. And, and here's what you need to do in a situation where there's an offense. Or this is how you deal with the situation. Come to him by yourself. Come to him with somebody else. You might have to tell the church. And in the end, you might not be able to hang out with them anymore, but you need to love them, okay? And then, and then Peter. <laughs> and then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? It's like, listen, if I forgive him seven, seven times is a lot. How often should they come? So we've got through this whole situation where God is, or Jesus is talking about somebody sinning against you and how to deal with it. And, and then also... that you still need to love them. And then Peter's like, but how many times can they do that and me need to, that, that I need to forgive them? Seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Most of us know that scripture, right? Up to 70 times seven. What is that? Is that 490? 490 times? 490 times. Is anybody going to keep count 490 times? Don't tell me if you do, because it's a lot deeper conversation we need to have. <laughs> because you shouldn't keep count. 70 times 7. How many times should they do this and I still forgive them? Just don't remember how many times. Just like say, hey. Well, it's six, seven, eight. Can, can somebody think with me about if you're sitting there counting how many times, what else are you doing with your life? And I think about this because I, listen, I used to have an issue with this. When I was younger, when I was growing up, holding a, an offense against people, things that were done against me, judging them. Because all of a sudden, you get, this, you get this offense, I can't believe they did that. And all of a sudden, then there's judgment. I'm going to tell you how you should have done things, and not only that, I'm going to tell you what you deserve because you did it. And you know what that does? That puts you in between them and God. That's what the Bible says. It says when you judge somebody, you're putting yourself over them. But the problem is God is over them. When you put yourself over them, God is looking at you and not them. So you better be careful when you're judging somebody. Your offense becomes judgment. And then all of a sudden you're like, see, God, this happened. And they should be dealt with like this. And this is what they did me wrong and all this stuff. And God's looking at you and saying, really, all I'm seeing right now is all the stuff that you're doing wrong. Why don't you get out of the way and do yourself right, and then I can deal with them. And then Jesus, after this, talks about a guy that was 
owed money from one of the people under him, and he comes and says, hey, you, you owe me money. You, you owe me all this money. And the guy and his family are getting ready to be sold as slaves. He's like, I own you now because you can't pay me back. He's like, I can't pay you. Please. He says, no, you're, you can't pay your debt. And so this is going to happen. And he falls on his face and says, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And he says, I do. I forgive you. I forgive your debt. You can go. And then that guy that his debt was forgiven goes out right away and he finds somebody that owes him money. And he says, you owe me money. I need my money right now. The guy says, please, please, I can't pay. Can you, can you just wait a little bit? Just, can you please forgive me? And he, he says, no, it can't be forgiven. You owe me money. I, I don't know about you, but this, the way this scripture progresses in this chapter, talking about who's the greatest, how much we think of ourselves, or how humble we are dealing with offense and not getting caught up in those things and coming and dealing with situations together in the right way, forgiving them more times than you hopefully can count. And then all of a sudden, he's got this parable about somebody that was forgiven a debt, but then goes right out and doesn't forget a debt owed to them. Do you know what this stands for? We were all forgiven a debt. Each and every one of us were sinners. Each and every one of us have a debt that couldn't be paid on our own. And Christ said, I forgive you. Not only that, I want to bring you into my family, but I forgive you. So how dare we turn around and hold something over somebody else? with all that we've been forgiven, with all that we've been forgiven by our Heavenly Father, by God, that He says, I forgive you. The debt was too great for us to pay. It couldn't happen. We, we, we couldn't settle that debt on our own. And Jesus came, died on the cross for our sins, and paid that debt for us. And how dare we turn around and say, no, you... You owe me this debt. <laughs> the cross. Is a stumbling block for our sin. The offense of the cross is the only offense that we should feel. And you think, well, yeah, I, back before I was saved, I felt that, and then I came to know Christ, and, and now, I, I mean, it's not a, an offense to me anymore. Well, I would venture to say that the more numb we come to the offense of the cross, the more sensitive we become to the offense of people. Because when we are constantly feel, feeling what our sins and what we have done and how much it's been forgiven by the cross, how could I possibly even think of somebody else and be offended? How could I possibly turn around? I want to feel what my sins, even though they've been forgiven, I want to continue to feel what that work of the cross did in my life. I want to continue to feel the, 
I want to continue to feel the, the weightiness of what God did in me. If we continue to, to feel who God is, what he's truly done for us, then our heart and our mind is so taken up with that an understanding of the forgiveness that has been shown to us, then when I turn around and see something or somebody comes at me and it, something that could be an offense, I, I have to say, all I can see is the cross. All I can feel is what, what I've done and how it's been forgiven. And I can't help, I can't help but forgive. I can't help but love because all I've, all I've been given is love. I can't, even, I can't even hold an offense because, because I'm holding on to who Christ is. <sighs> Would you stand with me?